All right, it seems that every outfit from sporting and business organisations right through to religious and charitable groups are supporting the push to enshrine racism in our constitution. And I'm sorry to keep coming back to this, but this is the most important thing confronting our society today. And in the absence of so much detail, one can only presume that these outfits are doing so in order to curry favour with the government or to ensure access to the rivers of taxpayer money that many of them actually depend on. Now, one of those groups that's embroiled in this is the Catholic Church, where the Catholic Bishops' Conference recently stated that the voice, quote, could be a significant step towards a more just and equitable Australia. All right, I'm going to add, it could also be a step toward a less just and more divided nation. And the bishop's support is far from unanimous, with one bishop being quoted as saying, whenever the church marries the spirit of the age, she will be a widow in the next. A recent article even suggested that one of the greatest popes in recent church history, that's Pope John Paul II, would not have supported the voice. Now, the author of that piece, Rocco Loyacono, joins me now. Rocco, thanks for your time. Why do you claim that John Paul II wouldn't have supported the voice? I mean, it is a big statement. Oh, look, for two reasons, I think, Corey. One, uh, John Paul II uh, lived under communism, um, so he knew uh, how destructive it was uh, for humanity, and therefore he had did everything he could uh, within his power to, to, to defeat it. And therefore he also, knowing its destructiveness, had no time for its ideological children, namely liberation theology and identity politics. Uh, which leads me to the second reason. And um, that uh, is what he said to the Aboriginal people when he came to Australia in, in 1986. He addressed them. And uh, he's, this, these were his words. He said, Austra Australia is part of you and you are part of Australia. And he said to them that you are... The Aboriginal people of this country must show that you are actively working for your own dignity of life. These are his words. On your part, you must show that you too can walk tall and command the respect which every human being expects to receive from the rest of the human family. So he knew that Aboriginal people should reject the idea that they are perpetual victims are forever in need of these special uh, measures that identity politics demands. Yeah, Rocco, I read your piece and I found it really interesting. And one of the uh, things you quoted in there was uh, present injustices are not removed by resentment. Additionally, there's a real danger of creating some of the new injustices that uh, John Paul II spoke of in terms of the voice. What are some of those potential injustices that you see? Well, these are linked uh, to uh, the, the, this uh, undermining of the idea of uh, equality before the law, which is, has its origins in St Paul's letter to the Galatians when he said, look, between, among you there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor flee, free, nor man nor woman, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And, and that is the basis upon which the idea of equality before the law is based. And uh, the, the Western liberal democracies, uh, this has been their great mission uh, to implement this ideal over the last two hundred years. And we have seen uh, in the submissions to the Joint uh, Committee on the Voice uh, many eminent uh, members of the legal profession, judges, uh, KCs, uh, constitutional law professors, uh, have uh, said that the, the danger of this voice is that it will undermine this fundamental principle of equality uh, before the law. And the other thing that they're highlighting, uh, particularly constitutional lawyers uh, Nicola Cerrone and Peter Garangalos, is they're underlining that after this voice uh, there is this uh, idea that Indigenous people will be uh, treated uh, specially under our laws and have some kind of the state will owe them some kind of fiduciary duty which is what has happened in Canada and that will open up the doors to uh, uh, compensation. Um, these are very real dangers and look, I'm sure that uh, once people know this, uh, this will breed the, the, the resentment and, and won't serve for purposes of reconciliation at all. Yeah, this is the thing. We have to make people aware that there are unknowns that we can accept no assurances on by the yes people who want you to just take it on faith, it's all going to be okay. But there is, there is claim. There are claims. There is an absence of Aboriginal voices in the public square. I'd like your comment on that briefly. But also, can you tell me what the Catholic bishops actually expect the voice to achieve? They've they've put out a, a feel good statement, but no specifics. 
Well, I, I'm not sure what they actually expect uh, it to achieve. Um, I, they, they seem to be adopting the same approach that corporate Australia and these sporting bodies are adopting uh, by saying that it's simply about reconciliation uh, when it's uh, actually far more than that. And as I've alluded to uh, in my previous answer, if, if, if they went deeper and had a look at uh, some of the uh, submissions from the leading uh, experts uh, on this, uh, they would see that this is uh, far more than that. And indeed, um, Indigenous leaders who uh, supported The Voice have said, look, it, it's far more than a recognition of the Constitution. It's about treaty and it's about truth. And uh, the, the faithful of Australia need to hear that. Yeah, so some of the Indigenous voices are saying this is much more than it pretends to be, while the Yes campaign are saying, oh, it's much less than other people suspect it will be. The two versions of events cannot reconcile, and that's why we need people like you, Rocco, to bell the cat and put these things into the public domain. Thanks so much for your time and joining me on Bernardi.